Greece. Ethiopia expresses dismay about the League of Arab States' decision over GERD. And Sudan sees fire in danger as fighting continues in Khartoum. Hello there, this is Addis News Hour. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Kiran Abbaina with the news. Our first story, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said as part of the fifth year of the Green Legacy Initiative, seedling preparations are underway to plant 6.5 billion saplings this year. Ethiopia will continue planting billions of tree seedlings for the fifth consecutive year and the coming rainy seasons as part of the Green Legacy program initiated by the Prime Minister. In our fifth year of the Green Legacy initiative, seedling preparations are underway to enable the 6.5 billion that we will plant collectively this year, Prime Minister Abiy said. The share of seedlings for fruit trees is also substantially higher this year, he noted. It is to be recalled that Ethiopians have planted 20 5 billion saplings under the Green Legacy Initiative program initiated by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in the past four years. Ethiopia reaffirmed commitment to maintaining economic growth by formulating policies to protect the safety of all citizens and solve social problems creating job opportunities. The remark was made by Deputy Prime Minister Demagama Konin at the opening of a two-day high-level National Social Protection Conference underway under the theme Social Protection for Nation Building in Ethiopia. He added that social protection is a key function that binds the government's social mandates with the general public. To Ethiopia has been implementing a social protection system for citizens who are vulnerable to challenges including conflict and drought, McConnell indicated. He added that the government has been intensifying efforts to protect the welfare and well-being of the citizens. He said that social protection is an anchor that binds the government and the people in addition to its role to addressing social and economic crisis, stressing the need to invest on vulnerable citizens. In this time of uncertainty, efforts need to be made at setting policies that will bring communities together. Social protection is indeed a key tool that binds together the social mandate in the community. Actions need to be taken because social protection is an anchor for ensuring citizens' holistic security. AU Deputy Commissioner Monique Nsambegnawa said on her part that Ethiopia adopted the African Union Agenda 2063 during the Heads of State and Government Summit in January 2020 held here in Addis Ababa. The agenda recognizes the essence of social development inclusion, leaving no one behind to realize their aspirations, the goals, and priorities of the African Union Agenda 2063 towards transforming the current socio-economic pathway over the continent. This conference, uh, marks an important milestone. this conference marks an important milestone in the realization of the African Union's Agenda 2063, which is a vision for building the Africa we want. In 2063, we want everyone on board, including those in vulnerable situations. In her keynote speech, Labour Minister Argogetes Faye underscored that limitless social problems have piled up, both natural and man-made, adding these five have created huge burden on the government. Taking this opportunity, I would like to call on all stakeholders to establish a sustainable social protection system that would work in a meaningful way, changing the livelihood of our citizens. The conference will also help to cultivate and enhance stakeholders' understanding and support towards the protection agenda for better positioning among national development priorities. 
The Ethiopian Finance Minister Ahmed Shide met with Bridget Pickle, Director General of Africa at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development on the sideline of the 2023 Annual Board of Governors of the African Development Bank Group meeting in Egypt. During the occasion, the minister expressed gratitude for the German government's ongoing financial and technical support for Ethiopia's development efforts. He also highlighted the importance of German support for implementing the reconstruction and recovery plan for the conflict-affected regions of Ethiopia. The Director General assured that minister that the German government will continue to support the government of Ethiopia's ongoing efforts and pledge to engage with other partners and advocates for Ethiopia's interests on various platforms, as well as on multilateral institutions like the African Development Bank, IMF, and the World Bank to produce maximum support. The finance minister is in Sharma el-Sheikh, Egypt, to take part in the 2023 annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the African Development Bank Group. ይሄው <laughs> ካጠሎም ጀብራናል ካጠሎም እና ካይደባቸው ሜዳማ ፓርቶች እንደሞስና በጣም ግሪን ሆኖ ስናይ በቃ ከከፍተኛ ተስፋ እንዳለን ነው የሚያሳየው ኦሞ ጎሽ በጣም ብዛት አለ ከዚህ በፊት በጣም ብዛት ነበር የተለያየ ማሽኖች ድምጻለ ማሽና ድምጻለ ለዛ ነው ትንሽ እንኳን ከመስ ወደ ሌላ ቦታ እንደሄድ ነገር ማሽ ወደ ሱዳን ነው ወጥ እንደሄድ ያደረገ ያለ በጣም ብዙ ነበር ወመ ቢራ ፈርክ ያለው ቁጥር ስፍር ያለው ነበር Welcome back. Ethiopia denounced Egypt's last-ditch attempt to derail the EU-sponsored talks regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam or GERD by taking the matter to the Arab League. In a statement it issued, the Ethiopian Ministry of Foreign Affairs said those who are attempting to negotiate a peaceful settlement to the GERD issue are being insulted by the resolution of the League. Analysts have been saying that Ethiopia should not have to remind the League that the Nile River and all riparian countries are found in Africa. Kasa Anjani has prepared the following reportage. Ethiopia has been saying time and again that the League is once again serving as a spokesperson of one state disregarding basic principles of international law. Such attempts to politicize the issue of GERD might advance friendly relations, nor support efforts to arrive at makeable solutions that they are not based on facts or supported by law. The GERD is an African issue that needs an African solution 
Association. Moreover, the African Union is facilitating tripartite negotiations between Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt to resolve the remaining outstanding issues in good faith and settlement in a spirit of finding African solutions to African problems. On February 8, 2023, Egyptian Foreign Minister Samar Shakur returned a pivotal gathering of African leaders. He had an opportunity to talk about the Ethiopian Prince and Sudan, but he purposefully avoided doing so. Instead, he used a mindset rather than to that mooted colonialism and colonial agreements to bring a topic up on the agenda of the Arab League for the second time this year, the previous Friday, to establish control over the Nile River. Egypt's opposition to the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Saddam Gerd is further emphasized by the resolution adopted at the Arab League summit. This approach is seen by Ethiopia as a blunt dig at the African Union and its member nations. The issue which affects a river in Africa is extremely relevant to African countries and ought to be addressed by the African Union. The African Union and its member Members are viewed as having been flagrantly disrespected by disruptive disregard. First, Ethiopia started building the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Saddam on the transboundary Abai, below Nile River, in March 20. 11. Studies undertaken by Ethiopia demonstrate the overall regional benefits of the GERD, and Ethiopia has made sure that the dam would not have a substantial impact on countries downstream. To promote confidence and collaboration in Abyssin, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan came together to form a tripartite commission, which will evaluate any unanticipated repercussions of the dam. The International Panel of Experts IPO which consists of members from Ethiopia, Egypt and Sudan, as well as foreign experts from South Africa, France, Germany and Great Britain, was established as a result of this procedure in May 2012. After a year of evaluation, field work and debate, the IPOE finally delivered its final report in June 2013, which was warmly received by Ethiopia and Sudan. A two IPOE recommended investigations will be carried out by the Tripartite National Committee, TNC, which was constituted in August 2014 to oversee them. Although Egypt insisted on putting out pointless agendas and politicizing technical matters, the TNC has continued dialogue and cooperation among the three nations despite occasional delays. However, Egypt's expectations from these discussions remain unfulfilled. Egypt seeks recognition of Earth's 1959 agreement, which it refers to as a historic right. Egypt hopes for these negotiations haven't been made dawn. Egypt wants a 1959 agreement, which it refers to as a historic right recognized. Ethiopia, which was not consulted or be included in this agreement, says this right as a historic wrong, even though there is a right. Right. Ethiopia, a sovereign nation, is adamant about using Nile waters without subjecting its people to Egyptian colonial rule or denying them their fundamental right to drink from the Nile. The president of the three nations explicitly stated an agreement on the Declaration of Principles job, that each nation had the sovereign right to fairly and appropriately use the waters of the Blue Main Nile without inflicting major harm. Egypt, however, remains opposed to the DOP and the consultancy services agreement in early meetings. Egypt needs to give up its offensive and colonial mindset and integrate into the world community of civilized nations. All the nations have access to the Nile. Political will and improving sensor cooperation are worries required. Politicizing denial had never been beneficial to Egypt and will never be of any further assistance. And unfortunately, the pressure Egypt is exerting through the Arab League is sad and useless. Such behaviors corrode the crucial cooperative and kind spirit required for fruitful talks. This kind of pressure runs counter to the values outlined 
demanding that collaborational principles and prevents productive discussion that could help resolve the problems at hand. Ethiopia remains firmly dedicated to upholding the principles of fair and reasonable use of the Nile waters and the peaceful settlement of any conflict. The Ethiopian government has repeatedly urged all parties to follow the agreed upon principles and have constructive communication to settle any unresolved issues. Ethiopia has the right to demand that Egypt abstain from Earth's illegitimate monopoly claim on the Nile River and its position based on colonial accord. The issue of the Grand Ethiopian Prince and Saddam is ultimately a question of pride and sovereignty for Ethiopia and Ethiopians to continue supporting the developmental drive just as it is any other nation's right to harness its natural resources. The Organization of African Unity, or OAU, which was established on May 25, 1963, to promote unity and solidarity amongst African states, was transformed into the African Union, or AU, on the 9th of July 2002 in Durban, South Africa, to better accelerate the political and socio-economic integration of the continent. Talking to ETV, a historian, Ayala Bekri, said the African Union must emphasize on the principle of African solutions to African problems to make the continent economically independent. Shagao Yamato has the details. Africa Day, formerly African Freedom Day and African Liberation Day, is the annual commemoration of the foundation of the Organization of the African Unity on 25 May 1963. The main objectives of the OAU were to rid the continent of the remaining vestiges of colonization and apartheid to promote unity and solidarity among the African states. African leaders allowed to be its headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, due to the embracing vision of Emperor Haile Selassie. The final decision to declare Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, as the, its headquarters for OAU was the work of Emperor Haile Selassie and it was the work of his able uh, foreign minister, respectable uh, Katama Yefro. And, and so their vision, their kind of sense of deciding to embrace Africa at that critical moment and thereby putting all their efforts to make sure that, that the headquarters should be in Addis Ababa was the work of our leaders, our leaders of the 60s. The OAU were too weak and its influence inadequate to deal with the internal and external conflicts, poor governance, human rights abuses, poverty and underdevelopment from which much of Africa suffered. As a result, the organization was transformed into the African Union on 9 July 2002 in Durban, South Africa to better accelerate the political and socio-economic integration of the continent, promote and defend African common positions on issues of interest to the continent and its people. Becker indicated that African Union has regional emphasis to work on the economic, politics and history of the continent. AU on the one hand have regional emphasis, you know, like to uh, strengthen the regional union first, you know, like ECOWAS of West Africa or Maghreb uh, Association of North Africa or SADC of, of South Af Southern Africa, East Africa community. And then we also have in our area IGAD, okay? So they decided to kind of work on that. And then through them to even, you know, establish what they consider the African continental free trade zone or free trade area. So to really work into the economics, the politics, the culture and the history of, of the continent was the aim of the African Union. The historian urged the African Union to emphasize on the principle of African solutions to African problems to make the continent economically independent. This principle of African solutions for African problems, we really have to kind of emphasize on that and then find a way that we will not be dependent on aid and, and loans because you have, a lot of African countries have borrowed so much from, of course, bank institutions of the West. And then at times it, it even becomes difficult 
to maintain the loan, let alone to pay it. Efforts are well underway to observe the 60th year anniversary of the Zen Organization of African Union in different parts of Africa, particularly in its headquarters at Dissab on Thursday. African Development Bank Group President Akinwemi Adesina called out developed nations for not honoring the $100 billion US dollar a year climate finance pledge they made to developing countries. A combination of droughts and floods is causing massive losses of people and infrastructure, leading to rising numbers of refugees in vast areas of East and Southern Africa and in the Horn of Africa, he stated, and emphasized that climate change is causing havoc anywhere in Africa yesterday. According to him, there is still much to do, as Africa's private sector climate financing will need to increase by 36% annually. The African Development Bank is spearheading climate adaptation efforts across the continent and has devoted 63% of, of its climate finance, the highest among all multilateral development banks. Furthermore, he pointed out that the bank's new climate action window will support millions of farmers, enabling them to access climate resistance. And seats. The institution has also launched the Desert to Power Initiative to develop 10,000 megawatts of solar power to benefit nearly 250 million people across the Sahel. In business, African ministers of finance, planning and economic development have called for reforms of the IMF's Special Drawing Rights or SDR system to strengthen the global financial safety net and make more liquidity available to developing countries. The call for reforms was made during a meeting of the Africa High-Level Working Group on the Global Financial Architecture on the margins of the 2023 annual meetings of the African Development Bank Group held in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. The SDR system came into existence in 1968 with the aim of supplementing official reserves and facilitating global liquidity. The IMF's Articles of Agreement stipulate that SDR allocations are meant to be considered every five years, referred to as basic period. Throughout the 12 basic periods since the inception of the SDR system, there have been merely four general allocations and one special allocation with two notable ones in 2009 and 2021, it was indicated. Africa, with a population exceeding 1.4 billion, received fewer SDRs than Germany, a country with a population of only 83 million, ECA's chief economist argued. The ministers underscored the importance of ensuring that SDRs are directed to countries that require it the most. The Ethiopian Coffee Exporters Association expressed attending the International Coffee Conference is essential to promoting the coffee industry and drawing in global coffee buyers. According to Gazat Werko, General Manager of the Ethiopian Coffee Exporters Association, maximizing coffee initiatives or incentive programs is essential to improve proficiency with coffee growing nations. Haptam Ashagri reports. Coffee is the backbone of the nation's economy that generates a huge amount of foreign currency every year. Talking to TV English, Gazat Woko, who is general manager at Ethiopian Coffee Exporters Association, said his association exported close to one million quintal of coffee in national coffee buyers. In the current year, in the Ethiopian calendar in 2015, we have exported around 180,000 tons of coffee and uh, earned around 992 million dollars in income wise it's very it's a good success because when when you compare it with the, uh, the quantity exported the total value earned is really substantial Ethiopia is participating in an international coffee conference according to the general manager Ethiopia is providing coffee product despite regional continental and global difficulties Gzat underlined that the international coffee conferences are helpful to create market linkage as well as to boost business-to-business -business ties with other anchor companies. Exhibitions and conferences is uh, a very good approach to meet your, uh, your buyers or if you are buyer sellers. So 
uh, in such kind of exhibitions like Speciality Coffee Association exhibition, which is undertaken in uh, Portland, Oregon, USA, such kind of exhibition benefits you. Instead of going to your buyer here and there, the, all, of, all of the buyers and sellers meet in one place and discuss and uh, have a good uh, connection. So, it was, uh, as usual, it, it was very successful. He further expresses that strengthening incentives in the coffee sector is vital to fairly compete with other coffee producing countries at a national level. Uh, the coffee sector, as it has in a big challenge with uh, international coffee producers and uh, very knowledgeable coffee buyers, it needs an incentive from the government side. Different type of uh, schemes can be applied to incentivize the coffee export. It could be an exchange rate, dollar to dollar. It could be in a retention scheme, how much dollar you can retain for yourself for import or whatever uh, for expansion of that company out of what he is exporting. Even there are different types of incentives. Coffee should be incentivized to fetch a uh, required amount of uh, for the exchange. Exact added for the efforts are needed to solve the major bottlenecks of the coffee sectors to maximize its unprecedented role in the nation's economy. Mostly, it's related to delivery time and quality. Delivery time in Ethiopian case is very long and it's not possible to maintain what they have promised to deliver. The shipment time is, is really longer than any other country. The quality, still we have a problem in quality. We have to improve the quality. Most of the coffee sold to international markets from Ethiopia is grade five coffee. That means it's inferior quality. If we can export grade one or grade two, we can fetch a better price, a higher price. That was, that was good, but still we cannot make it uh, to higher grade uh, coffee. So still we have lacking uh, coffee quality. The Ethiopian Coffee Exporters Association noted that preparations are well underway to organize the African Fine Coffee Conference in Ethiopia next year. Now finally heading over to Sudan, artillery fire could be heard in parts of Khartoum and water, warplanes flew overhead on Tuesday, residents said, raising fears that in, in, Intense fighting would erupt and shatter Sudanese hopes raised by an internationally monitored ceasefire. Some other residents reported relative calm early on Tuesday, the first full day of a truce that is being tracked by Saudi Arabia and the United States and is meant to allow for the delivery of humanitarian relief. After five weeks of fierce battles between the Army and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, the warring factions on Saturday agreed to a seven-day truce that began on on Monday aimed to allow for the delivery of aid. The ceasefire deal reached in talks in Jeddah has raised hopes of a pause in a war that has driven nearly 1.1 million people from their homes, including more than 250,000 who have fled to neighboring countries, threatening to destabilize a volatile, a volatile region. Although fighting has continued through previous ceasefires, this was the first to be formally agreed following negotiations. Now, a recap of the top stories once again before we go. Ethiopia expresses dismay about the League of Arab States' decision over GERD. And Sudan sees fire in danger as fighting continues in Khartoum. Well, that brings this news hour to the end. Thank you once again for having joined us. It's goodbye from my end.